All right, here we go. Welcome, welcome to the Back to the Sal study course in uh, 2021. Um, the purpose of this of this session, uh, it's geared to a recruit level, and uh, we've been trying to uh, take a journey through the Getty, which is um, Emma's principal, uh, the principal uh, a document that Emma uses for its recruit training program. And uh, I read the book and take note of all the things that we might miss uh, if we are principally just showing up and training on the south floor, because of course there's a fairly large distance between what's on the south floor sometimes and given to you by your instructors and what's actually um, in in the book. Uh, so we're on our last session, believe it or not. We've walked through each play one by one, uh, and this will be the uh, this will be the final session. And um, yeah, it's been it's been amazing. All of this has been recorded. I do have a few episodes to upload, uh, but all of this is, is recorded and it will be there on the internet for all time, all awards and all. Recorded and unedited, might I add. <laughs> uh, so I hope it's a useful resource um, going forward. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so um, my usual spiel. These sessions um, are principally uh, guided by myself and for the last long while, uh, Cal Recruta as well. Uh, we are, of course, free scholars of the Academy, but we're not here to tell you what to think. We, uh, we have, uh, but we have our opinions. And uh, in the scholarly fashion, we want to convince you um, to, uh, uh, to, to, or we want you to be convinced by the same evidence that convinces us that forms our opinions, right? Uh, and, and so it's in that spirit then um, that we're, we're leading everybody through this material. If you have questions, um, then please do, uh, please do ask them. If you have a question, it's almost guaranteed that a bunch of other people have it as well, but they just haven't asked it yet. So there are no dumb questions. Um, all questions are great and please do, please do ask them. Uh, lastly, after this session is over, um, we're going to be starting uh, in in this in these Mondays. We're going to be starting an examination of Vadi. And I know I just said this; these sessions might not continue when we restart. Um, if we get far enough into Vadi that <laughs> I really want to push it to the end and finish Vadi, then we may. So, <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what happens in September. But we're going to be starting Vadi nonetheless. So n next week, we're going to be doing this same uh, format, but we're going to be looking at uh, at Vadi instead. Uh, and, but, and we're going to be looking at Vadi with respect to what he can tell us about Fiore and, and uh, what he can reveal, uh, corroborate, what he disagrees with, with Fiore. Um, so it'll be great. It'll be great. Um, all right. I think that's, I think that's it for the intro. So let's get, let's get into where we left off from last week. Did 40, I actually press record? RB. I did. 45 RB. Thank you very much, BD. 45 RB. Oh, wow. Okay, great. So um, just to uh, su to summarize again, for those of you who, who may not be caught up with the videos or who missed last session. So we're looking at the mounted section in Fiore. The mounted section in Fiore, broadly speaking, is in two main parts. Uh, combat on horseback against someone who's mounted and combat on foot against uh, people who are, are mounted. We are in the first section still, um, so on horseback against someone else who is on horseback. In this section, um, relatively in relatively organized fashion, the section begins lance on lance, okay, then sword on lance, then sword on sword. And now we're on um, unarmed versus unarmed. And that's how the section will, um, uh, well, broadly speaking, that's how it'll end. These two plays are from the from the end, uh, or from a, a couple of pages after. But anyways, uh, so let's let's get started. So 45 RB is where we ended. Did we do 45 RB? I think we did. I don't remember us doing it, so let's let's do it again. 
All right. So here we go. 45 RB in the Getty. Uh, Alex, would you like to start us off? This is a play of Abrazara, which means a play of the arms. When someone is fleeing from you and you follow him to his left, uh, grab him by the neck pieces of his bassinet and uh, with your right hand. If he is not wearing armor, grab him by the hair, by the right arm from behind his shoulder. And in that manner, you'll make him fall. Thank you very much, Alex. All right. So the first thing to say here is that we've started the wrestling section, or rather... <laughs> Um, so, somewhat curiously, where we began, Fiore, we, we are now ending. Um, we began with, uh, broadly speaking, a discussion of uh, Abrazzare, and we're ending the mounted section with a discussion of Abrazzare. Uh, and also to reprise a point that we've been reflecting on in the mounted section, um, it's, it's agreed upon by everyone here, and it's a common, uh, commonly shared idea anyway that the um while it's true that basic equestrian skills form the foundation of the mounted section obviously it's also the case that um the the footwork as it were of the horse uh replaces the footwork uh, the, your own footwork if you were on foot so the horse is now is is now your feet right and so um the horse is of course another animal with its own will and whatever so that's part of what makes horsemanship complicated but um if one didn't think one could wrestle on horseback uh here not only is this an example but we're going to see a bunch of really interesting examples of wrestling moves that you could just as easily do on your feet but of course you're oh uh, you're mounted and a lot of the wrestling moves that we're going to see are going to end up in some way uh causing the enemy to fall um, and, and we already know from Dagger that throws are uh, extremely good, often fight enders, so that should stand a reason to us. The mechanics of this one, at least in my view, and, and, and Kel, please uh, um, also, also comment, the mechanics of this one are pretty simple. I mean, he's just dragging somebody down from behind, uh, from whatever furniture is on his neck or his hair. Um, clearly not polite, but this isn't, of course, polite fighting. And that fall's going to suck. Um, when someone is fleeing from you, hey. yeah. <clears throat> Observation. Uh, mm -hmm. He's reaching across the other side of the rider and pulling him towards him. He's he's on the yeah. far side. It's important because those horses have to be right up beside each other, like bumping up against each other for anyone to reach that far over. Yeah, and that, uh, that's... Uh, Again, that's a... the horses are walking, mm -hmm. which means we're talking mm -hmm. about a melee situation. So neither mm -hmm. one of these is moving at speed. In, but if in, in the picture, yeah. behind... Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, the representation is important. This is not done at a gallop, tearing down the road or something. This is, this is scrambling around, and the horse is maybe turning around on the spot. So it's, it's you're there... And you have to reach across the other person <clears throat> to pull them. So I would suppose it would like once you get a hold of the right side, the right shoulder or the right side of the head, you're doing the same imbalance that one is doing in the third play of Abrazari, where you're pressing the head, twisting it around to the twisting it around to cause the person to lose their balance. There. Yes, yep. that one. Uh, yep. Third play. Only you're reaching around behind the other side right. and grabbing something. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, so I th those are some great observations. Um, uh, I think, uh, well... With respect to reaching around on the uh, to the other side of him, um, the first thing that comes to my mind when we see this in the image is uh, his comment about grabbing the, by, the, by grabbing him by the helmet cheeks or uh, the cheek pieces of his bassinet with uh, with your right hand. Um, with with aventails and, and and things like that, if you pull on the opposite side, you're going to also twist the head around, 
and that's going to further discombobulate him. So that stands to reason uh, if you're grabbing him by pieces of his helmet, uh, uh, whatever they are. With respect to grabbing him by the hair, uh, I mean, I'm sure this would work uh, too, I guess. Um, you could also just grab him by the hair. Maybe he's some sort of long-haired Merovingian. Uh, and uh, and you can just you can just tug on it and he falls down. Who knows? Uh, but the head the head twisting definitely further discombobulates it. We know that from wrestling on the ground. So yeah, that stands to reason. And and it, it is a fair point that they're not um, drawn at a gallop. Who knows if we could do this at full speed? Probably not. That would be that would be pretty nuts. Uh, but um, yeah, they're shown kind of in a a can what is it a canter? Is that what it's Walk. called? A walk. It's a walk. Yeah. But all, all in all, otherwise, a pretty uh, standard wrestling move. And that kind of fits the theme that we've been looking at in the in the mounted section so far. Um, a, a lot of stuff that is familiar combined with a lot of stuff that is completely foreign to us. So any other questions or comments about this one? Yeah, just a question. I wasn't there for the rest of the mounted section but do they keep actually the kind of scholars and masters uh mechanics uh, from one play to the other that's a good question um so in the sword section in the sword section um every scholar is a scholar of uh Kota Lunga. these two uh, six these six masters the Kota Lunga masters Mm -hmm. And that goes on for a couple, ugh, so excuse me, that goes on for a couple pages. Uh, so mm -hmm. here, here, here are the six masters. And then we have mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five, six, mm -hmm. uh, and then some counter masters, um, and then an, uh, a counter contrary. And then we have these grappling plays. Mm -hmm. Before the six masters, I don't think it's... I, uh, I'd have to I'd have to look at it again, but I don't think it's it's uh, super regimented um, mm -hmm. with respect to scholars and masters. So the clearest example of scholars and, and uh, masters and scholars is this: the, these six masters here and their scholars. I couldn't tell yeah. you what what scholars these Abrazare scholars are, uh, or what master these Abrazare scholars belong to. Maybe the Kotalunga masters. Maybe I don't know. No. Yeah. I don't agree. It's just uh, these are these are things you can do on horseback without a sword. Yeah, no, that's what they're, I'm saying. They're they're, they're just yeah, as likely to be. Not, yeah, ex exactly. They're 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 situations. They're yeah. uh, as opposed to say in the dagger system, which is fairly regimented. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> once you get in past the sword and two hands, things fall really really far from the the system of. Uh, you know, it all being regulated under one, like one master type of thing. They're in the mounted section. They're basically uh, two masters or with a lance, and I think two masters with a sword. And then there's the wrestling stuff. And and, and that, uh, that's the way I think of it. And then there's the wrestling stuff. Because there's situations where. Um, Somebody that normally carries a weapon uh, is of a class that's allowed to carry a weapon on their person is not going to uh, go for most of this kind of stuff without some sort of uh, serious piece of steel being involved. If it happens that uh, you're both disarmed, then this is where you do these things. Or if it happens where you've surprised someone or they try to surprise you t for a ransom, uh, or for a murder, um, and you don't have a weapon on you, well, these are things you can do. It's a, it's a very uh, rough society with a lot of uh, what we would call today mafia hits. A lot of family ransoms, that kind of stuff. And a lot of hair pulling. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, a good thing I'm not one of these weirdies that has a long hair, you know, and a long beard. Yeah, I, I'm not so weird. sure that it, 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 <laughs> it, it never really... Uh, never really gets mentioned but you see the scholars all have short cropped hair uh younger men tended not to keep their hair long because they were constantly in and out of helmets every day that's why i got into so many fights because they were all jealous of the the, the long bearded handsome men yeah um, you know like guys like guys like uh, anthony laviola with the big hair you know like uh, uh 
he's going to keep it because he can, whereas the rest of us really can't have hair like that. And that's the point. But grabbing them by the hair is a possibility. Grabbing them by <clears throat> the uh, collar. The collars were stiff and high standing, uh, enough, at, at least a finger high. There was enough material there that you could hook your fingers behind it and get a good grab. Whereas grabbing on, say, the the shoulder or the or the trapezoid is going to be hard to get a physical grip, especially when you're moving. Whereas hooking your hand in in behind the uh, collar is pretty easy stuff. Mm -hmm. Hair or no hair. But you know, if the guy's got long flowing hair and you can get a grip on it, right. he'll go down very nicely. Yeah, and that that actually just bring up a good point uh, in that with respect to wrestling. Um, it is an int there's an interesting argument that the judoka make about how there's lots of really interesting wrestling moves, throws, chokes, and things like that, that um, you can only do if you're holding on to someone's uh, clothing, right? And a lot of traditional wrestling that is done uh, in the Western world is done uh, without, w without wearing clothing that can be used against you. Right. And there's various reasons for that. Um, but the point uh, the point there is the greater point is that uh, if you're actually wrestling in a combat environment, uh, you're not going to be wrestling in a leotard. You're going to be wearing clothes and sometimes armor or whatever. And it's absolutely legit uh, to think about how to use that clothing against somebody in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a in setting. And this is a good example. Um, all right, let's uh, move on to the next one. The counter con uh, counter to the yeah, this is the counter to the last one. Forty five RC in the Getty. Andrew, would you like to read this one? Okay. This is the counter to the of the previous play. <laughs> nor will that play work against this counter if this is performed at once. Here is how it is done. As the opponent grabs you from behind, immediately exchange your rein hand and grab him with your left arm in this manner. Thank you very much, sir. All right. <laughs> I like this one. It's pretty simple. <laughs> uh, it appears as if it's just a, uh, simply an arm bar that you kind of reach around and, and and put them in which definitely stops whatever this whatever the attempt is it's funny here it really looks like it's a follow-up to the previous play where the person was trying to reach yeah that's, it is, that's it exactly, is. it's the counter yeah, it's yeah that's counter, exactly yeah. right yeah it's the counter okay. to it yeah that's why that's why the the mm -hmm. player doing it has a crown and a garter yeah yeah, yeah. See the little garter peeking oh, out. Oh, the garter. Okay, now I see. Yeah. yeah, we we were joking earlier that there's actually one play later in the text where uh, the artist puts the garter on the arm, and then you're like, oh yeah, you can always see their arms, but <laughs> throughout most of the text, the artist is like, fuck, where am I gonna put the garter on this guy? And he's hiding it in between horses' necks and legs and shit like that. It's just too funny. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, so this is to try to mm -hmm. mount it as well. If you're walking the same direction somebody grabs from behind, turning, and then getting the arm up. Well, uh, on that nobidi, it's actually very, well, it's similar in concept to the, uh, I should just have the grappling play open, since we're going to refer to it. It's similar in concept to the escape from behind, which is scholar, Egypt, 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 Egypt. Uh -huh. uh, the 7VA, the seventh scholar in the grappling section where you kind of you in this case you step behind yourself but you also reach behind yourself too right in this case the um the the boar's tooth you get is on their shoulder um but in this case when you reach behind yourself not only can you get above him but you can bring the arm underneath and get a a nice uh a nice a, a bar on it so yeah it's great So here the conclusion of a move would be only breaking the arm because like wide on horse I'm not sure if it's even a good posture to make them fall. 
adapt. Well, there, there could be equestrian ways of, of exploiting this that, you know, I'm not an expert with, so I couldn't describe it. Like, I don't know, what if you just moved your horse to the right and kept a grip of his arm? You know, if his horse didn't follow you exactly as your horse did, then he might, you might drag him off his saddle or something like that. You know what I mean? As, I, you know, with respect to a standing arm bar, I'm not, you know, I doubt it. There's a lot of moving parts here. So arm, mm -hmm. The arm bar would have to be pretty solid for you to break it. But um, that's going to be up to your equestrian skills, I would imagine, in this case. Yeah. But yeah. The mm -hmm. one thing that is denied, so it, in in Abrazare, um, we we uh, one of the things that helps mitigate problems is your ability to change ranges, right? And we talk about this a lot um, when we wrestled uh, uh, <laughs> every day in the sal as a warm up, um, changing ranges, going from close to striking distance and striking distance to close can often mitigate a problem that's arisen, but in wrestling on horseback. You don't have that flexibility so much, right? It's much harder for the person to go into close grappling here than it is for him to, you know, break out as if he was on foot. He's going to have to do that with the horse, and the horse can only get so close. So I would say this guy's in a much, much deeper shit than he would be if he was on foot. That's my my sense of it. The uh, the Zugidori is not going to be able to wiggle out of this because it happens so fast. Yeah, and with the relative speed of the horses uh, mm -hmm. suddenly suddenly changing, his arm will be broken without any effort. But if the, the countermaster also uses this blow percussively against the elbow, the situation's complete. Like there's nothing more need be done. Oh yeah, if, if, you, you, swing, if, he, if he gets you that right on, on, you take, yeah, 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 you take yeah. your left hand off the rein and you know yeah. change hands, bring your hands together, take your left hand off and do uh, an overhead sweep and down mm -hmm. behind his arm. When you bring your arm forward into the fairly wide space between the horses, mm -hmm. you could bring that thing forward as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. you get it to the mm -hmm. point where you know he, you're in the spot and he's still struggling with you, sure, yeah. then you just spur your horse a bit. Yeah, that's that. Like it's gonna it's gonna be harder for you to keep mm -hmm. your saddle, but it'll be almost impossible for him to keep his arm uh, unbroken. Mm -hmm. Dislocated elbows are nasty. Mm. And gross. <laughs> oh. Yeah. All right. Any other questions about this one? All right. Let's tr trudge onwards. We're gonna, I, was, I, I was really looking forward to today because we're going to get to some really interesting and neat stuff. All of the, uh, all of the really, not that what we what we just looked at in the last couple of weeks wasn't interesting, but I, I really like this, uh, some of these these wrestling plays on horseback. I think they're pretty they're pretty neat. Um, all right, folio forty five R D is where we are next. Um, do, 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 do. Andrew, oh no wait, you just read didn't you? Bastien. Would you like to read this one? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So this, this student is about to throw the opponent off his horse by grasping him by the stirrup and putting him upward. If he doesn't fall, he'll remain suspended in the air unless he's tied to the horse. This play won't fail, and if the opponent's foot is not in the stirrup, grasp his ankle, and you will also be able to lift him up, as I have said before. So... Do what I have just said. All right. So you Thank you, Bastian. Throw them in the air. All right. This is the. I like, to, I, like, whoop. Yeah. I like to think of this one as the toss the uh, toss the loudmouth. Yeah. This is something you do to tell me it's a loudmouth. Yeah. The whoop. Yeah. 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 This is you know the equivalent of shoving a chair at somebody that's trying to uh, approach you. It's just. Oh, no, you don't. Well, it's, it's funny. I, you know that I, I hate to bring it up. I don't want to trigger people. But, you know, you know, that movie, that one movie called uh, Braveheart. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the scene when Mel Gibson is riding around the English generals and he's kind of taunting them. You know, he's like, uh, go back to your own lines and throw your head between your knees and kiss your own arse. You know that I, I always imagine him like riding around them. And then just to fuck with him, just kind of going whoop and doing this one <laughs> to one of the attendants or something, just so that he he could do it. But anyway, 
Um, so a yeah. context here is very mm -hmm. specifically unarmed because if you reach slow like that and the guy has oh to yeah to oh yeah this is sure yeah. no no weapons have been drawn or the weapons are gone right this is the, yeah. the kind of thing that would happen uh, of an encounter between two rival uh parties out, out riding especially if they're riding their territorial lines uh one of them's on the other side of it you know, you, you do this kind of stuff to humiliate them because it's much more uh, nasty to make, make someone look like a fool in front of their peers or their, their uh, followers than it is to try to kill them because that could create a vendetta where uh, you know, lots of people are going to get killed simply right, because they belong to one family or another. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I like you to uh, keep talking. I just want to get from the, uh, the text. Mm, okay. Sorry, Kyle, continue. Mm, well, it's just that uh, uh, humbling an opponent mm. is, is is much safer than uh, injuring them. You know, in it, terms of long-term survival for you and your family. And culturally, too, Kel, you know, uh, there there is a point to be made that, um, you know, it's be, because of the social, ethical, religious, cultural implications in killing somebody, uh, and because of how martial people sometimes are, there even on even in foot combat, there's such a thing as, you know, getting to a point where you could clearly kill someone and not doing it, and the other person realizing that he's, uh, you know, he's out of his league, and and, and the situation is resolved. Right. It's actually not so much that that person uh, realizes that are the league and cries uncle, but that everybody that follows him, all the people, his supporters, see that he's screwed. Right. And that has a lot to a lot a mm. lot to do with the prestige and you know reputation and prestige was was literally currency in this period. Yeah. <sighs> So I'm a bit surprised about the the feasibility of the technique because to reach down to your opponent's ankle, uh, I mean, there's a reason why we don't attack legs in general. It's because it's so far. <laughs> ah, you are anticipating the next play, sir. <laughs> it has its risks. Well, it yeah. has its risks. I would risks. like to say Bastian is correct because this is not as easy as Fiori makes it out to be. Just grab the leg. Uh, it's that would be very hard. But I would also like to point out that the Zugador's horse is in a cantering or galloping position, and the player's horse, the the scholar's horse, is walking. So you would have to. This is a situation where the Zugador's horse is taking off, or he's spurred off, or he's leaving. And it's he's he's taking off, and you reach down and grab his stirrup at the last minute, or his leg at the last minute. I'm, I'm really with that. I'm with you there, Bruce. I'm with you. Yeah. All right. So, um, anticipating the next play, which we shall move on to, it is not without risks, and the risks, as you say, Bastian, the risks are absolutely in line with. Um, what we understand and expect about attacking the leg from being on foot. Uh-oh! <laughs> this guy's like, shit. Folio 45 VA. BD, please and thank you, sir. Here is the counter to the previous play. The opponent grabs you by stirrup or foot, throw your arm around his neck, and do this quickly, which will enable you to throw him off your, his horse. Do this, and he'll be on the ground without a doubt. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, all right. Speak of the devil. There you go, Bastia. Whoopsie. There's the counter. So, um, in all... Okay, in all uh, mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, if I may... Sure. First observation, in this case, the countermaster's horse is not 
moving anywhere. He's at the walk. So what he's saying is this, if the person is foolish enough to try this on you and you're not, it won't work unless the person is cantering away. Like the person has just said something to them, you get flipped in the finger, whatever, and he spurred his horse and the horse takes off and at the last second you reach down and grab his leg. That works. What he's saying here is it won't work if you just try and reach down and grab somebody's leg and they're not they're not moving. Yeah, so so Bruce, I think that's a really important point. It's a really important point. If we recall, um, so back when we were in the sword section, we talked about a really important concept in in fighting, and it and it shows here that it's it's coming up again. And that concept is this: it's that the problem with the leg shots, the problem with the legs, is that you can't close lines and attack the legs at the same time. So in effect, attacking the leg is as if you were, you know attacking the head or body going for a, a shot that, that you that you've earned right and we know that we can't we can't land a shot we can't commit our sword to their body unless we know we've dealt with their weapon otherwise their weapon could be killing us at the same time so the problem that presents with legs is that how do we attack the leg on uh if we don't know where their weapon is and um, one option is, of course, to have some kind of a tempo advantage. So if we know that we're ahead in time, we could maybe use that time to attack the legs if we know that we, we shouldn't expect to be grabbed, right? We shouldn't expect to be attacked while we're attacking the legs. So it's not by structure that we've defended the blow. It's because we're ahead in measure and we can, we can afford to spend some, spend some time to commit ourselves to the leg. Now, as Bruce just said, if you're just standing still, and we know this very well from wrestling, if you're just standing still and there's no distractions and there's no leader or follower, and you just try and do something, it'll be instantly countered. Instantly. And and we should expect that. So um, it, we have an example of how this is done well. Uh, you know, of someone succeeding in this in this effort. Surely it's because the opponent you know, or was behind in time and he just let it happen. And we have an example of this failing and an easy, an easy way that this could fail is if he wasn't actually ahead on time, the thrower, and he just went for the leg. And so the countermaster's response by going, okay, fuck you. And throws him by his head. So uh, it's a fairly complex and important fencing lesson involved in just this little, uh, this little exchange here, but that's really important. I'd also like to make an observation that the Zugadori's left foot is out of the stirrup. <clears throat> now, this may be because he's in the middle of the being thrown, or it may be because he reached down so deeply for it to get across the, the, the cantle, he had to step out of the stirrup because having your legs straight in the stirrup means you can only bend over so far. Whereas if you pull your foot back, mm. you can bend over a little farther. Bruce, your comments to that. Mm. I've never had a problem reaching down and touching my horse's knee, front knee, while keeping my legs straight. However, my saddle does not have a high cantle on it. So mm. What's a what's a cantle again, to, Bruce, for the for the assembled that, group? That's the part that covers the front of the crotch. Okay. So mine is a is a European saddle or it's a UPP sa U, a UP saddle, <clears throat> which means that I can keep my legs straight, reach down low over the horse. These saddles may prevent that, so I, I can't say to why his leg would be out of the out of the uh, other thing, well, or it could be simply demonstrating what happens when you haul somebody out of the saddle. Yeah, that's my thought. It's a fifty-fifty thing to me. I know that on a Western saddle, if if I tried to do that, I could only reach down to about my foot. I wouldn't be able to reach across to the other person's foot, even if the horses were almost touching. Um, whereas if I leaned over and pull my foot back out of the stirrup. Um, 
I can get a little bit lower because my foot counterbalances my upper body. Having played around with this particular kind of goofing around on horseback, um, not not so much to try to throw each other, but actually pinching my girlfriend's butt while she was riding. She was the, the head of the riding school and just goofing around, you know, because she'd ride circles around me, literally circles around me. But trying to get, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, inappropriate play, let's put, because this is being recorded, uh, involved in the horsemanship. And, and uh, it's just my, my experience on a Western saddle was that there's only so far that you can reach down because you lose stability. Anyway. Yeah, well, uh, I'm sure that would annoy your, uh, and humiliate your enemies as well. So that's definitely something to keep in uh, uh Keep in the pocket. I'm sure I might approve. Um, any other last questions about this one? Uh, you know, this is also this is probably worth saying. It's this is also uh, um, a very standard response against leg attacks in stand-up wrestling. So the problem, uh, or uh, let me back up. So when we reflect on the kind of Abrazari that Fiore appears to be showing us, we notice that Fiore never talks about wrestling on the ground. Right? Now, there's lots of important things to say about wrestling on the ground, specifically how to get up under duress and all that. And, and it's a very important skill, absolutely. But... And it doesn't appear that Fiore uh, wants to talk about that subject uh, 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 too much. Um, most of the wrestling is done standing up uh, and also not bending over too much, right? And um, another, another possible reason for this, if we recall, is that there's good reason to read the armored section all the way through the book. And not just when the armor appears in the book. So it's not as if we should read the Abrazar section that began this book as dealing only with the clothing that the figures are wearing. None of the none of the figures in the Abrazar section appear to be wearing armor. But circumstantially, because of the way they wrestle, that wrestling can apply, broadly speaking, in armor as well. And going for the leg, in armor or out of armor, when you're trying to wrestle and remain standing in your fortitudo, you know, position as much as possible. Going for the leg is very risky. And uh, and if it's you go for the, it's not risky. It's suicidal. I'm under I, I'm underplaying it, but it's 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 it's, it's troublesome, right? Not least because it, realistically, in order to go for the leg and having a have a chance of picking it up, you have to bend your torso somehow, right? Some you know maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger and the strongest men in the world can literally reach down an arm and pick up a whole leg, you know, subduing someone's leg muscle with their arm muscle, maybe, right, in, in, in certain cases. But usually you have to use your body, your body mechanics to pick up that massive leg muscle. And that involves you bending over and doing something resembling a, kind of a leg shot uh, in, in, in modern wrestling. And this brings your head into play, not only against striking, which is catastrophic in and of itself. You could put your face right into an uppercut or something terrible like that, but also to effective grappling. So this is, the point is, this can happen on foot as well. And it's a, a, a main reason, uh, so it would seem, that Fiore doesn't like to talk about wrestling on the ground or these kind of attacks to the leg in, uh, in wrestling. He likes to do it upright. All right, moving on. All right, uh, Folio 45 well, VB. Amber, Amber, oh, had, a, had, a Amber had a question. Oh, okay. Uh, let me bring up. Uh... Amber, are you here? Can you hear us? No, maybe she was talking to somebody else. She's unmuting. Uh... Okay, if you have your comment, Amber, uh, type it up, and we'll 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 handle it. In the meantime. Uh, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, Forty-five <clears throat> VB in the Getty. Um, do you, do you? Bruce, would you like to read this one for us, please? And thank you. Uh, 
<clears throat> there is a way of throwing someone to the ground together with his horse. Here's the way to perform this remedy. When you go against someone with your horse, ride to his right side, throw your right arm over the horse's neck, grab his bridle near the bit, and forcefully pull upward. Also, make the chest of your horse go against the opponent's haunches. This will cause him and his horse to fall. Thank you very much, Bruce. All right, this is one of the cooler plays in the mounted section, I think. Um, the first time I saw this, I was like, what the fuck? What is going on here? <laughs> but yeah, he's flipping the horse with the bit in the horse's mouth. How cool is that? Did you know you could do that? I didn't. He's well, grabbing the bridle, basically. The reason this works is because while a horse's neck is very, very powerful, up and down, straight forward, it's very, very weak from side to side, which is why a bridle works. And you can pull a horse's head to the side very easily, even if the horse is resisting. The other thing is, if you think back to those cowboy movies where somebody shoots them and the horse takes a fall, this is exactly the move they're doing at a gallop. It, it causes the horse to bow. So you can pull the horse's head right around, upside down, and he's pushing the horse the other way, so you're unbalancing the horse. The rider doesn't really have much option in here. Well, uh, Cal made a great point last week about the nature of the bit as well. You want to speak to that, Cal? Yeah, modern bits today look like a kind of a chain, an elongated piece of chain. Uh, in most cases, it depends on the, uh, there are lots of different kinds of, of horse bits uh, for various sort of cowboy and a question, uh, what do you call it, a, a dressage and all that kind of stuff. But medieval uh, bits and spurs were quite cruel. And the reason for that was once the horse had its blood up, and, and they always rode stallions in the battle, always. Um, once the horse had its blood up, it was, it was a challenge to keep that horse under control they weren't docile because they were as much of a fighter as the person on their back they were trained to be this way and the spit the bits that we find in uh, you know antiquity uh, in various digs and uh, pieces that have survived as uh, funerary offerings or what they have a big sort of triangular spoon kind of thing on them uh, so when the the rain is pulled that thing bites into the horse's tongue um, today we would consider this incredibly cruel, but hey, we we consider chopping someone up with swords and axes incredibly cruel, and that that's just the change of culture. It's not just a different time, but it's a literally a different world. Um, the horses' bits and the spurs that were used, especially on an armored horse, uh, a horse would have, say, uh, layers of quilting, uh, the barding, that you know, the covering with the heraldry and all that stuff on it. Mm. That wasn't just decoration like a curtain. That stuff actually provided protection to the horse. Problem being that the horse is not going to feel your spurs through it. So the spurs are actually quite long and cruel as uh, they went from, you know, basically the uh, Norman period into the 13th century. Most spurs were just literally a stabbing, like a big spike kind of thing. Um, and they started to develop uh, different sorts of rowels as well. And the rowels have uh, tines on them. I mean, think about a pizza cutter that's just not a, a straight wheel, but is a whole bunch of sharp, hard spikes. Yeah. Uh, not not plain iron, but actually decent quality steel that you could make a knife or whatever out of. Obviously, not the best, the very best steel, but spurs were incredibly expensive. Hmm. And even plain spurs would often have silver on them because uh, it helped keep it from getting tarnished because it was constantly, constantly being wet and you know, the, the horses sweat and, you know, all over and riding through water and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so when you look at medieval spurs and uh, and uh, the, the bridles and horse equipment in a number of different books, there's a particularly good one by a woman named Anne Highland. She wrote two different books on the different periods, medieval, early medieval period and, well, high medieval period and late medieval period. But anyway, she goes into the details of, of the trappings, the equipment, in great in great number. Uh, so it's the sort of thing where 
we're not we can't compare it to the modern uh leisure riding stuff they had stuff like that too because they did a lot of leisure riding they traveled around for business sometimes they just went out for a ride to get fresh air um but for for battle you had to be able to command the horse under enormous duress and uh to a certain extent horses are willing to fight and whatnot but they're also willing to run away and um they're not stupid. They're not stupid critters at all. And you look at a horse like uh, uh, Dave Savet's Naya, that's a monster. It's a gigantic horse. Um, a horse like that just didn't exist in the medieval period. Uh, his other horse, Arrow, is a perfectly normal sort of horse you might call a rouncy because it's a riding, a riding horse, you know, a, a leisure horse. And, and someone might, you know, do their travel from town to town on it, but you'd never fight on a horse like that unless you had no choice. And believe me, sometimes they had no choice. Uh, certainly, the the Knights Templar had uh, periods in the 13th century in Outremer where they were riding mules into battle because that's all they had. The horses weren't available. They died in transit, whatever. And, uh, you know, having to ride a mule into battle and try and, and get something as stubborn and, and idiotic as a mule to do anything that you want takes an enormous amount of skill as a rider so when we're thinking about this we can't think about it in comparison to what uh, you know a cowboy's riding a quarter horse or or uh, dressage riders or people that do steeplechase and, and that sort of thing totally different horses totally different equipment um, so when you grab the bit of a war horse even if it's not fully armed it's going to have a uh, a pretty nasty sort of bit in its mouth. So this this is going to create a gigantic reaction from the horse immediately, and that's the purpose of it. Well, and speaking of uh, speaking of skill with uh, with the horse, who knew there was such a thing as horse wrestling, right? Because on top of grabbing the bit in this in this play, of course, uh, a, a non negligible point is this: also make the chest of your horse go against the opponent's haunches. This will cause him and his horse to fall. So on top of whatever, you know, Abrazai play you're doing, uh, you also have to control the horse and you're getting your horse to to wrestle the other guy's horse in a strategic way that'll help your play. All right, that's, that's crazy. It's more but than a pretty nice body check is the trick. Yeah. It's so, funny because horses do this to, to each other all the time in play always bumping and shoving against each other and throwing low kicks and stuff you'll never see a horse kick another horse high they always kick low because if they kick high and miss they're off balance and you have their horse will nail them, especially if they're close together it's a fun thing to watch horses you know like a, a stable of horses just out in the field when they get bored a couple of them start pushing one one another around and and it's always going to be a couple individuals that are like this because most stables keep horses that are pretty, uh, you know, calm and relaxed and sort of thing, not very combative. You don't want a horse like that and with a whole bunch of inexperienced riders. But uh, I don't know. I've known a few horses that were kind of challenging. Certainly when I was a kid, my pony was a nasty, nasty critter. Yeah. Uh, when you... So you, you reach across and above the head of the, the horse, grab the the bridle, over, the bridle. Yeah, and over the, his neck, behind yeah. the ears. So the head rotates, and so the horse is going to fall towards you? The horse is going to fall past your horse's butt, because you're slamming the front quarter, the shoulder of your horse, into the other horse's butt. So it destabilizes the hips, and it, with it being off balance with its head up in the air, it's going to go down over its right quarter. It's not going to fall straight down. It's going to fall down kind of past your horse's butt. And you're already moving that because the horse, your horse is turning to slam the shoulder in. So it's going to do uh, a movement that will take its forward its shoulders are, are uh, you know, into, I can't remember the correct word for the four horse of all horse, but um, it, it turns the, the, the front of the horse's shoulder into the other horse's butt and moves its own butt out of the way. Does that make sense? It's like sweeping your leg backwards when you throw somebody. Okay-ish. Yeah, if you, if you haven't been 
uh, around horses, and most of us haven't. It's it's something to see. Horses are quite nimble in turning on the dime. They can spin mm-hmm. in a circle like there's no tomorrow, and mm-hmm. it, and it and it for them it's as easy as breathing. Uh, a, a mm-hmm. question from Amber to the horse guys. Uh, Amber asks, is that where the term hard mouth comes from? A horse that doesn't uh, that just doesn't notice a nasty yeah. bit in its mouth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Um, so, Bastian, what's happening here is by driving, by the um, scholar, driving his horse's front into the horse's flank. That is the area just in front of the, the horse's rear legs. By doing that, it is the same thing as if you were throwing somebody and you planted your foot behind them so they couldn't move. Yeah. When you were going you were hip to hip. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good so, analogy. So yeah. you, the, the analogy here is what he's doing with his horse is he's preventing that horse because the horse that is being thrown could get out of it by, by rotating, stepping, mm-hmm. by stepping back, sideways right, right, with yeah. his right leg. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what you're doing with mm-hmm. your horse is stopping that horse mm-hmm. from stepping. Uh, yeah. So it's okay, kind of so when you... Yeah. When you do the rotation in, in wrestling, when you turn the, the, the chin on the side, you keep a control on the lower back Correct. so that you make, you make sure to turn the spine, right? Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The mechanics mm. here, mm. as far as the horse is concerned, is the same of you doing the fourth or fifth play of Abrazai. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thanks. And back to Amber's question about hard mouth. Um, I, I don't know of a horse that has a soft mouth. That's something we describe to dogs, like the retrievers and stuff like that. Uh, hard mouth, soft mouth. Um, but a horse with a hard mouth, especially a cart horse, is one that becomes unreliable. Um, uh, Dale Geenow bought uh, a horse quite a long time ago. I don't know if she's still alive, but Maggie was Maggie was uh, a very nice horse to ride, but she had been. Uh, a Mennonite cart horse, and the Mennonites sold her because she had a hard mouth. She be she would she wasn't as compliant as they expect for a cart horse, so they put her on the market and sold her. And, and Dale got her cheap. Um, and North ended up riding her most of the time and taking care of her. She was in a little movie that we did too, uh, out in Nova Scotia. She's a really really great horse, but uh, you could pull on the reins of that horse. There's a picture of me riding her at uh, John's uh, John's farm, where I'm literally pulling back on her because she saw some other horses doing something across the meadow, and she wanted to go play, and I was trying to get back to where everybody else was so I could get off of her, and she didn't want to really play with it. So there's a you know I'm I was quite wrestling with her to get her to to put, go along with me because she I mean she didn't know me so I was just another fool on her back like in all the others that had been playing around. Um, but uh, Dale commented on it when, when, because he could see it from a distance. He says, "Oh yeah, she's got a hard mouth." Um, now this is the, a mare, a small mare. Consider what a large stallion with uh, testosterone poisoning would be like to try to control. That's that's about the size of it. Yep. All right. Well, the counter to this play 45 vc uh connor would you like to read this one for us please and thank you sir certainly here is the counter to the previous play which the opponent tried to make you fall with your horse this action is easy to remember when the student throws his arm over your horse's neck to grab the bridle you must immediately throw your arm around the student's neck, which will quickly cause him to let go, as you see in the illustration. Thank you, sir. Okay. So let's blow this picture up a little bit more so we can see it. So it's kind of hard to see where is... Uh, this is the clo- it's the clothesline. 
but uh, yeah, cold, it looks like it's on the neck side of, of, of yeah. his neck. Yeah. So uh, so obviously, if you if he's reaching, so similarly to the leg situation, if he's reaching over to get the horse there, he's leaving himself open on his right side. His arm can't close his lines and attack the horse at the same time. So uh, if it's not done in the right measure, then uh, this this threat can be offered, which is, as Kel said, likely the closed line situation. And uh, if the scholar is prudent, he will let go. <laughs> uh, otherwise, he'll be falling as well. So. Great. So is the counter reaching from the front and uh, bringing his hand towards the, the back of the neck? Or is he reaching from the back and kind of pressing down it's it's hard to see but it kind of looks like they've illustrated a hand oh. here on the shoulder yeah it, it, it definitely it's it's yeah. it's one of the dagger plays so, like when yeah in the first first master remedies there's a dagger play where uh, you know the guy's wide uh with his mandrito and you you put your your hand into it and you immediately step through uh leading with your arm and there it is third scholar yeah and uh, over he goes, you know. Yeah, I was thinking of that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's exactly the same. Gotcha. So instead of having to block the leg so that he can't turn, you're the horses. The horses. The the block. You know, he's not going to be able to turn out of this. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's enough space between the horses for him to fall down through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And if your horse goes over anyway. He will be landing underneath you and possibly <laughs> underneath your horse. Yeah. Ooh. That would suck. That's bad. Yes, landing underneath a horse sucks. Yeah, that's a good way to end up in traction. Yeah. Yeah, and the moment you have his head, he cannot really keep putting at your horse's head, so there's your counter right there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but to to have the presence of mind to counter this, um, the guy's either got to be pretty sloppy, or you just you're aware of this kind of stuff happening. You've seen it happen. Maybe you did it to somebody else, or whatever. So you're prepared for it. But having the presence of mind to switch from whatever you were doing to uh, counter his horse, this all happens in a split second. Yeah, for sure. So this is definitely not a long protracted, uh, protract, uh, protracted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Protracted affair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Follow up question. Like the, the, the initial play where you, the the first student uh, drives the horse to the ground. Do you think the horse would entirely rotate and fall very quickly? Yeah. It, it's a mm -hmm. sudden change of direction. Mm -hmm. Same way that uh, you know how we have an invisible triangle when we're when we're standing, yeah. uh, and it shifts as we shift our feet, but the triangle is always there, front and back. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, uh, the horse is going to go down if its head is turned enough and it's still moving forward. But if it's not moving forward, if it's just standing, like in this case, you see its forepaw, uh, uh, foreleg up in the air. It's about to go down, but it's not quite going to go down because this guy uh, didn't get the hip slam and the shoulder slam into into your horse because he was cut off before he completed the action. It's it's quite shocking how far a horse can turn its head. It's almost like a snake. Uh, it, 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 it is surprising to most people because you don't often see it. But when horses are at play, a lot of times... They're, you know, they're running together in the same direction, and the one that's in the lead will turn its head back around and try to bite the other one in the face or the nose. It's pretty amazing. More prosaically, a horse can scratch his own shoulder with his teeth. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's Absolutely. Crazy. That's a good, good point. Yeah, all right. Um, let, let's... <laughs> Uh, let's uh, clip on here. We have about seven plays left, so I think we'll uh, we'll we'll be able to finish tonight. Folio forty-five VD. Next here, uh, Daniel, would you like to read for us? Oops, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, Daniel, would you like to read this one for us? Uh, okay, his silence is a pass. <laughs> Graham, would you like to read this one oh, for us? Yeah. Oh, Daniel's here. There you go. Either edition. Yeah, sorry. No problem. Okay. This play is designed to take the rain away from the opponent's hands, as you see in the illustration. When going against another horseman, the student should ride to the opponent's right side and throw his right arm over the neck of the opponent's horse. He should then grab the latter's reins near opponent's, near opponent's the left hand, with the hand thumb down, and throw the rein off the horse's head. This play is safer in armor than out of armor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Fury. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, all right. So uh, a similar play in, in the theme of the last few, uh, reaching across the opponent's, or the horse's head, not to throw the horse, though, but to grab the reins out of the, um, out of the, ha uh, the hand of the enemy to make it m more difficult for them to control a horse. Yeah, not so much out of their hands. That might happen. But mm. more likely, you're going to make the horse suddenly flinch because it believes mm. that its rider wants it sure. to go left. Right, sure. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, who knows? That might set up a, another another play. It could set up a clothesline maybe. It could set up who knows. Yeah, right? I was yeah. going to say, that would, yeah. that would be yeah. my thought. Mm. Give that give that rein a yeah. turn and the mm. horse will wheel to the left. And you hook the guy up at the, mm, you know, with mm, as soon as you leave your hand off of it. Yeah. Well, that's ugly, ugly, ugly. Bruce, go, go. My my reading of that, if you could scroll down to the text, yep. is when he says lift the horse, should grab the ladder's rein near the left hand with the thumb, and throw the rein off the horse's head. What I think he's doing here is he is reaching over to the rein that is on the left-hand side of the Zugador. He's reaching over there, and he's pulling the rein up over the horse's head, so now both the reins will be coming to the right side. And it would be very, very hard to guide a horse with both reins on one side of the horse. Yeah. Mm. Well... At least, definitely, they'll be out of the reach of the rider. The rider's still got his legs to work with, but that's right. only, what, half the equation, right? Yeah. Depends right. on the type of it's, riding, uh, because these, these saddles yeah. have pretty deep skirts on them, so there's a limit to what you can mm -hmm. do compared to, say, English-style riding, all that fine motor control you can do with your legs. Exactly. So, so um I think a couple of sessions ago, I believe it was BD asked about dropping the reins. And in that case, you you totally lose any contact with the horse's mouth. In that circumstance, it was not exactly losing control of the horse because the horse wasn't going anywhere. In this case, he would lose total control of the horse because before he could guide the horse again, he'd have to get the, the left rein back over onto the left side of the horse. Otherwise, you're just going to be running around in a right circle. Yeah. Like a ship whose rudder is stuck. Mm. Yeah, so like taking like the... the... Like oh. what sorry, happened Brian, to the battleship Bismarck. Yeah, the battleship. <laughs> uh, Tokyo yeah. drift with, a, yeah. with a, yeah, yeah. what was it, the Missouri? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, just that speaking of car now. absolutely it's... hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's like oh yeah I was, I was gonna say it's like coming in and just taking the steering wheel off of the car yeah to a great <laughs> to a great extent you've still got your accelerator and your brakes but you have no way to to guide mm -hmm. uh, horses aren't quite that difficult but you still got spurs and whatnot and you can use one leg versus the other and the horse will recognize that you want something but compared to the fine control of the reins no right right thanks yeah, so in the last few plays, we've seen that uh, getting... So one of the things you risk in this Albrazari situation on, on, on horseback is you risk having the steering mechanism uh, and the, the head of your horse um, uh, have your enemy have access to it. And they can, they can do bad things to you. <laughs> That's no good. Um, okay. 
Let's move on. Um, oh, yeah, we're getting there. <clears throat> okay, so th that's uh, that that's all the uh, the um, wrestling plays. We have a couple more um, mounted plays, and then we have the plays on foot. So um, folio forty six V A and B is where we are next. Uh, Graham, would you like to read this one for us? Sure thing. This master has tied one end of a strong cord, i.e. a rope, to his horse's saddle. The other end is tied to the heel of his lance. First he will strike his opponent, then he will put his lance over the shoulder and to the left of his opponent, thus being able to unhorse him. Ooh. Yikes. What? Uh, thank you very much, Ooh. Graham. Okay, so here we have this picture. Um, let's take a couple minutes to talk about it. I don't want to dwell on it too long, but... Um, What's your understanding of this play, Kel? Because the setup is easy enough. He's striking with his lance. Okay, fine. What does yeah. the rope do? He's well, you hook it over. You hook it over him and clothesline him with the rope. As the lance goes by, you hit him with the lance or not. Doesn't matter. You uh, you know, once the points are past each other, mm -hmm. you can raise your lance. Maybe you raised it in a parry, you know, to beat his aside, whatever. But when you swing your arm up. It puts the rope in the way. Have you ever seen in the movies where, you know, they somebody strings a rope between two trees and yeah, takes yeah, off yeah. the pursuers? Yeah. Well, that's what you're talking about right here. This is the ultimate clothesline. So he's going to clothesline gonna... with your arm and shoulder. He's going to loop the heel of the lance high uh -huh. and, the, uh, and the, uh, the, the lanyard or the cord or the race rope or whatever it is he's got is going to wrap around Mm -hmm. the the fellow's head and shoulders because it's already past the point of the lance mm -hmm. so he can't deflect it if you were to purposefully beat his aside mm -hmm. whether you struck him or not you'd be able to do this thing mm -hmm. if you wanted to take him prisoner without killing him you'd be a lot better off than trying to hit him mm -hmm. to actually hook this thing like parry his spear and then hook yours around him and drag him off his horse and then you have your minions go pick him up you know that's, um, that's crazy. That's yeah. A, that, yeah. Very it, cool. It'd be, very... it'd be super unpleasant. But yeah. also, you'd have to have very, very stable fortitudo in the saddle mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. this happen. Because mm -hmm. you're dragging a lot of weight off. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this is something I wouldn't try out of armor. No way. No, um, no way. This would, I think, be the equivalent of throwing a lariat around him and oh, yeah. taking off. Because it's attached to the saddle. Yeah. yeah. So this it There's would be the equivalent anchor. of throwing a rope over him as you go by. Mm. And and just let the horse and the saddle do the rest. Very it's cool. not like medieval people weren't aware of how to rope things. I mean, maybe it wasn't a normal nightly practice, but every squire was required to help break in new horses as they were brought in and they were not you know not the heavily trained war horses but just whatever horses were purchased uh for the local you know the, the the local familia to ride the, the women and whatnot the horses had to be broken in and trained and a lot of times the squires had that job because it was a prestigious thing it was like showing off um there isn't a ton of write-up on it but there's something in nicholas orm about uh the development of Eng English chivalry and, uh, you know, it showed. Nicholas Orm is a historian who specializes in uh, youth, uh, like childhood p experience and, and, and uh, family relations with children and stuff like that through the Middle Ages. And uh, he's written a couple of really good books about that kind of stuff. But he commented in, you know, one of them about how the squires would often, you know, have fist fights to see who was going to, break a particular horse it's pretty cool yeah but i mean mostly horses that were that were trained already mm -hmm. were um you know were, were purchased and they were purchased from people that had professional trainers so they were a lot more like the you know modern equestrian schools that get a horse mm -hmm. when they're uh, still young and then and then train them up and break them from their you know whatever habits they don't want them to have and uh, you make them not necessarily docile, but at least uh, usable. 
Uh, but it's it's a thing that there were you know <laughs> a lot of uh, squires got broken arms and shoulders and collarbones and whatnot, uh, uh, so-called learning their trade. Yeah, and speaking of uh, <laughs> learning their trade, we get to my favorite play in the whole entire book, Folio 46 VC. It's the last uh, play on horseback. Kel, would you like to do the honors with this one? Sure. This rascal was running away from me towards the fortress. I ran so much that I caught up to him near the fortress, always at a headlong run. I then struck him with my sword in his armpit, a place difficult to protect with armor. I must now get away, since his friends may give me grief. <laughs> oh, I fucking love it. What a what a great play. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I, there are some martial lessons to take from this, I guess. I mean, we already knew the armpit was unprotected, and okay, if you're chasing down somebody, trying to kill them from behind, and trying to th- stab them with their sword under their armpit yeah sure okay seems like a nice play but for me what this play shows is number one why didn't you draw the tree in the play where you said you needed a tree you can clearly draw objects so what the hell and number two i just think this play is a very like fiore character play it doesn't really tell us much but it just kind of shows you a bit of furious character uh, and i like it i don't know to me because i've read so much about condottieri this is exactly the mindset. Mm-hmm. Exactly. There's a terrific book by George Trias um, called, I think, De Condigieri. And there are a number of chapters on particular different Condigieri through the period. And there's one of them that involves uh, Niccolo d'Este III. And uh, this fellow that is the, the, the subject of the chapter uh, was known for riding really fiery horses. And everybody knew that he, he was always on these horses that were, you know, meddlesome, as, you, as as it was generally termed. And here he is riding this horse around this, this border meeting with uh, Niccolo and uh, his boys with the, the neighboring um, captain. Well, the, the problem was the, the neighboring captain had held one of Niccolo's men, brother, in prison in absolutely horrible circumstances, like literally threw him in a hole and left him to starve. Um, so he was, he was in pretty bad shape when he was finally released. So his brother was this character that's the lead of the, uh, you know, lead of the story. Well, while they're having this chat uh, with Niccolo and, and, you know, these other people are all having a chat in a meadow. Uh, this guy's riding his horse all over the place like he can't control it, and you know, blah, you know. And, and, and people are laughing like they actually were. They found it comical. And then suddenly, this fellow was right up beside this other captain with his dagger out, and he does him in. That's it. Like from from chaos to here, you are right beside him, stabbed him, did him in. This really cool story about how little they cared for truce. You know, you, you you did horrible things to my brother. You're going to die now, regardless of the situation that it created for Niccolo. But then again, Niccolo would be like, you know, whatever. You want to cause me problems? I got you. I'll be a Huckleberry, right? Because he faced that stuff from the time he was, when he became uh, the Marquesa, he was like 18 or 19 years old. He faced that stuff through the first 10 years of his life on a daily basis because his uncle was... Um, in the opposite faction trying to take over the uh the sd estates so, i mean you know difficult times for difficult people great yeah, book and, though and really a, great book. a great book and uh this this play just kind of just kind of uh caps it off uh, but we're not finished yet we still have a couple more so let's let's look at these and then um once we're done i'm gonna just kind of sum up the series and make some final uh uh, uh, comments and things. Um, so, all right, Folio 46 RA. Um, quite a big play, a lot, a lot in here. Uh, Amber, would you? Uh, have you how, how are your audio issues? They're probably still, still not good. Um, if you can read, uh, if your, if your audio is good, type in the chat, and we'll give you the next one. Uh, back at the top, Alex, would you like to read this one for us? Here are the three opponents trying to kill this master. The first tries to strike underhand, which is why he carries his weapon at half-lance. The second carries it supported and fully extended. 
The third intends to throw his lance. It is agreed that these three must carry out their actions one at a time, with no more than one blow per person. Let them come one by one as they please. I won't leave this place for anyone's sake. I readily wait in Dente de Chingaro. When the opponent attacks me by thrusting lance in hand or throwing his weapon, I void by stepping off line with my right foot and passing obliquely with my left, beating the incoming lance away. Out of a thousand attacks, I shouldn't fail to parry a single one. What I do here with my Yavar... Giavarina. Giavarina, I could do with my staff or sword. And the defenses I use against the lance, I could also use against the sword and the staff. And I could perform the plays that follow. Awesome. Uh, and let's read those plays out while we're at it, actually. Because they're all really commenting on the same thing. So here's the next image right here, 46RC. And it reads... This is a, is a play of the master before me who rates with the Yavarina for the horseman in Dente di Cincaro. Passes out of line and parries entering this play. As I do... Does he... What is his nota bene show? I'll... For, fuck that. His first... His first... Um, his first edition really has some issues. Anyway. Uh, as I do in its appropriate place, I can strike him in the head with a cutter thrust since my Yavarina is very quick. So this is 46 RC here. So kind of doing what we just read. And uh, let me... Uh, hold on a second here, guys. And it's just the one more. Okay, great. And so the next, the last one here, 46 RD. Striking the mounted uh, man with the butt of the Yavarina. And this reads, This is a play of the same master as we saw above in Dente di Cingaro, although it is a different action. He could very well perform it. After beating the lance away, I turn my weapon around and strike him with the heel, since its metal end cap is wholly made of well-tempered steel. So here we go. We have these three plays. Um... I don't really have much to say about these plays other than that they seem to, so sorry, they seem to um, fit with my intuition as to how he would use the this weapon, given what we know about this, the axe and the spear. Uh, it should be noted, of course, this weapon is new. Uh, this weapon isn't an axe. It isn't a spear. It's some something resembling, a, well, there's many different kinds of pole arms that have a bladed uh uh, top a fighting top to it. Um, this one is straight, like a spear, and it's got it's got. Well, I forget what those are called, the little stoppers. Um, so it can't go too far into into the, your target, but you can use it to cut as well as to thrust. And so he's waiting in one of his favorite posta. He's going to. Uh, he's in armor, of course. He's going to deflect those blows to the right with his with his footwork and proceed with a cutter thrust as you would expect. And as we know from our axe and our sword and our spear plays, if the initial attack is defended, he can always come around with the butt. Uh, there's a YouTube called Modern History TV, mm -hmm. which uh, it's actually about a guy who's exploring what life would be like as a knight in the early four, 15, uh, 1400s. And he's he's mid fifteenth century. Yeah. Jason. So Jason. Yeah. Jason Kingsley. Yes. Yeah. And he made a video with a uh, a friend of his exploring Guy, yeah, Guy exactly Winter. this play. Guy Windsor. Yeah. It's 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 in the list uh, from about a month or two ago. It's in it's right on the discus list. Just roll up into the text stuff, and the, there's a link to it, which I find kind of comical because he you know describes Guy Windsor as. Uh, you know, a modern master type of thing. I don't think the guy Windsor would, he wouldn't say anything about it, but he'd be the last person to describe himself as a, a modern master. But it was also interesting because I really doubt that guy had ever tried that before. He managed it. It's kind of cool, but it's not something most of us have ever tried, and guy has very little well, experience in art. Well, neither, 
neither one of them had tried anything like that before, and as far as anyone can tell, nobody else has either. No, no, definitely not. Yeah, so yeah, like the rest of the like stuff. Arnie Keats, mm. Arnie Keats is mm. like, mm. Uh, I don't think he's ever done anything against people on foot, ever once. Mm. Well, like everything else in the book, it would, it would uh, need to be uh, trained vigorously to be understood. Ooh, no. the timing would well, be nasty. Yeah, no kidding. Right. Well, that's uh, that's what I was thinking. As a, especially if you're, you know, if you're free, like, uh, there's got to be something to be said about being in a mass of infantry against a charge of cavalry. So that's I'm sure one situation. And there's things you had as an individual uh, uh, infantryman in that situation. There are things you'll have to pay attention to and things you don't have to pay attention to. As someone who's kind of like uh, alone, uh, you know, in this situation isn't. Uh, this this situation in the book here isn't uh, the context isn't in a mass infantry formation of any kind. It seems as if it's you know it's portrayed as one individual against one horseman. Then you can imagine oh, he's, he's mm -hmm. definitely on his own here because a mass of infantry he wouldn't need to do that. He would just need to hold it up with a bunch right, of other spikes. Th 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 that's what I'm saying. So as somebody alone, just to to emphasize Kel's point, you would damn sure need to make sure your timing was exquisite. Uh, on this, because um, the horse it's could be galloping, same. right? Or could be coming at you fast. You well, know. they will be galloping. They will be coming that. fast. Yeah. But again, I refer you back to the first Remedy Master of Sword in One Hand, where there's three Zugadors, and mm -hmm. one of them is throwing his sword. Mm -hmm. And that is about the speed that those will be coming at you as fast as a horse can gallop or as fast as somebody can throw it. And he says here... I could defend against the thrown lance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which the, so if you want to practice the timing necessary for this, mm. I submit that mm. you have practiced this mm. with the sword in one hand mm -hmm. against somebody throwing the sword. Fair point. A fair point. Um, and, and that is hard. That is, that is hard to, to do. Yeah. Aaron. Well, I'm curious about the, the yeah. footwork that would be done in uh, either situation because the depth is really weird. In these uh, images, you mean you uh, mean because it, uh, because it is mean? right leg first on the first image, and it's still right leg first in the second image, but it's left leg on the last image. So, and yeah. and this is one of the okay in the last image, yes. In the 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 second image, this is one of the so-called errors in the art uh, of the Getty. Um, because it does not follow mm -hmm. the footwork that is described. Mm -hmm. Footwork and described will take your entire body off the line mm -hmm. uh, because right. they're going to be targeting the center line of your body. And mm -hmm. when you make um, a slight increase with your forward foot off the line and then pivot on that obliquely off the line as he describes it, uh, it, it gets you enough off the line that their lance is not going to be able to track you. Because mm. they're moving quickly, and you move very quickly on foot, because it's only um, one passing step. Because placing your foot forward and off the line is just like we always do. Mm -hmm. You're not stepping. You're just replacing your forward foot in a mm. different position. Mm -hmm. So it creates a new pivot point, and therefore a new center line, like throughout the entire art no matter what position we're in, whether we're wrestling or whether we're using lances. So the cover here is a simple dented jugaro, which comes up behind the head of the opposing weapon, and the footwork pulls you off the line as you're lifting the weapon. So it's very dynamic, mm -hmm. but it's also the kind of thing where you got to judge what's coming at you very, very well. Uh, you're, so Prudentia is very... Uh, very much a second close to uh, Ardimento, because mm -hmm. you got to have stones of solid brass to stand mm -hmm. and <laughs> face a horseman mm -hmm. and a lance. Right. Oh, yeah. Again, uh, observe that the horses are charging. They're coming mm -hmm. fast, and they're coming fast. They are linear, so you are dodging mm -hmm. a straight-line attack, mm -hmm. which is not going to deviate yeah. in any way. Mm -hmm. If it's a thrown lance, it's ballistic. Or right. if it's a charging horse, it's effectively ballistic. But the because horse is planning. Not... The horse is planning to pass on your on your right, right? 
That's correct. The horse is, mm -hmm. the yeah, horse is planning to go straight at you. It's going to pass slightly to your right. Mm -hmm. So you are going to step with your right foot further to your left, mm -hmm. taking you off the line. Now the horseman has to move his lance uh, from a very linear position to an oblique mm -hmm. position, which is very difficult to maintain a good aim. Mm -hmm. But it becomes very easy yeah. for you to mm -hmm. knock it aside because you now have an oblique mm -hmm. angle with which to deflect mm -hmm. his his incoming lance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree a thousand percent. If you looked percent. at it, yeah. If you looked at it overhead, it would be the difference between uh, the the lance pointing forward at say a ten degree angle. If you step forward with your right foot, now he's got to increase to a five degree angle. And that means that your lance has a, a um, it's, it's not as straight against his lance. It now has leverage because mm. it's got a 10 to 15 degree angle on his lance. Yeah. Cover, in other words. Yeah, we know that the boar's tooth cover is extremely, yeah. uh, extremely is effective. Similar. This is exactly the same cover as against the Polax versus Posididana. And it's the same cover that we see in the sword and two hand section. You know, it's what we see in the sword and one hand section uh, in, in terms of making the covers and even the sword on horseback. It's it's all deeply related. They're, they're, they're completely integrated. So I can't see someone who isn't trained in this system not being able to figure this one out in about tenth of a second. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they can actually do it when it matters is another story, of course. But you know, it is a pretty simple play, technically speaking. Um, we, well, we, you know, we know it's it. my it's my feeling that no one would go out and face this with a weapon they hadn't practiced with. No one's smart, anyway. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, all right. So um, that um, that brings us um, to the end. Let's read the let's read the last bit of the manuscript just for um, for closure. Uh, closure. And I said uh, I said that last play is my favorite there, but this is my favorite part of the manuscript. This is my favorite piece of text here. Here ends the book composed by the student Fiore, who has recorded in it all he knows of this art. The whole art of arms is in this book. And this blossom is named the flower of battle. He for whom this book was composed should always be praised since he has no equals in nobility and virtue. Fiore the Friulan commends himself to you all, a poor old man. <laughs> and that's it. That's the, uh, the, that's the Getty. That's the Getty. Almost 30 weeks we walked through this. Um, so... Um, so who cares? What does it all mean? Um, I just want to say a couple things at the end that I hope people take with them uh, into the next year. Uh, and anybody reading this who may be studying, you know, uh, watching these videos while they're studying once we've resumed and whatever. So uh, this course, this Back to the South Study course uh, on, on Monday nights is geared towards Emma students specifically at our recruit level. And on the on the surface, what we've been doing is we've been um, walking through the manuscript, looking at it, reading the text, getting to know it a bit, asking questions, observing it, all that stuff. And um, like we say every week, all of that stuff is useful, uh, especially when you're actually training on the south floor. And it's really unfortunate if we're in a situation where our main experience of Fiore is we go into the cell and our um, instructors give us a bunch of drills and then they say come look at the book for 30 seconds point at a play and say this is what we're going to do and then you go back on the floor and then you do the play and you are tired and you go home and what your experience of fury then in that class was 30 seconds of looking at a play watching uh, or listening to somebody else describe it to you without any kind of discussion or whatever so that's a, a common experience i think of fury but um, again, I really want to hope, I hope this course emphasizes that a lot of important things can be learned by taking some time with the material. And, um, you know, th we took 30 weeks to walk through this, this course here. 
And one of the one of the things about Fiore, which is the case with any complex, multifaceted document, I mean, really anything worth knowing, anything worth knowing is complex enough that smart people who have studied that thing for their whole life have different opinions, right? Any academic subject whatsoever, even tradesmen, you know, we talk to 10 bricklayers and they'll probably tell you, you know, 10, you know, little variations in how to lay the same brick, right? And that's a commentary on the material itself, on the nature of the material, right? And that's one of the things that makes this subject so fascinating and so rich. It's that you can study this single book much less the whole corpus of Fiore. You can study it your whole life and always find new things and interesting things and insights about it. And uh, furthermore, it's the kind of study that, you know, you're, you're holding yourself down if you're only interested in one opinion. You know, we all have our technical preferences. Um, you know, I... Uh, uh, I favor certain interpretations of Fiore over others. Cal does as well. Anybody, all of us do, right? But the real advantage of being in a school like ours and being amongst so many scholars like, like we are, like we're fortunate to after this going on 20 year effort of building this school and building this group, the, adv the advantage is that you have access to the varied opinions of people who've studied this for a long time. And I really urge everyone, no matter if you've been in, you know, studying Fiore for a week or you've been doing it for your whole life or whatever, to cultivate the differences in opinion that you get when you're studying the art. Because some, you know, everybody has something interesting to add. And whether or not you ultimately agree with one or, or, or you know, of, of any 20 opinions, all of them are going to have something really interesting to add and they're going to help you understand this complex material more. So, you know, Kel and I have given you our opinions mostly throughout this material. We're going to continue giving our opinions until we drop dead. There are many other opinions to be had, and I encourage everyone here to go out and seek to seek those out and try to remember them. You know, uh, uh, in my mind, a really great example of an excellent, excellent state of scholarship in one of our students is if you know, Brian said, or, you know, Cal said, what does, what does uh, Aaron Beatty think about this play? What does Cal think about this play? What does, you know, Aaron think about this play? And you're able to give an answer. Well, Brian thinks this, Cal thinks this, Bo thinks this, Aldous thinks this, right? And knowing that context makes you, you know, gives you a really robust and wonderful richness that you, you can't, you can't get in an, in uh, an organization that hasn't been developing itself for 20 years. So, um, yeah, you know, I hope yeah, this, a really, yeah. Good, yeah. a really good example of that is, uh, watching some of the stuff that's coming up on the, the face page, page, uh, scholars of Fiori. I mean, you see people out there proudly displaying their, uh, you know, videos of their interpretations of this side or the other thing. And it's like they've been at it for five or ten years, and they consider themselves, you know, equals in the community. Um, in many cases, they're not doing bad because some of them actually paid attention to the work that was done in the 10, 15 years before. But some of them are just so far out of line. You just you look at it and you go, okay, have you actually tried that against somebody who wanted to throw your ass on the ground? So you have to be careful about accepting um qualification at face value simply because someone's the leader of a group um, there there are groups that are doing terrific work but they're doing exactly the same work that was done 10 years before because they couldn't be bothered to go back and read what else was you know discussed yeah. in a previous community so they're reinventing the wheel over and over again and I strongly recommend, that you develop uh, a sense for recognizing those people. Uh, not that their work is of no value, it's just that it's already been done. So you can compare it to what was done 10 years ago, and in some cases you'll find some new twist, but in most cases, 
they don't even get it. They just like they're they're getting the basics of it, but it's already been more deeply discussed uh, quite a while ago somewhere else. Uh, unfortunately, the lifetime generation of uh, martial arts students is about three years, versus the mm -hmm. you know lifetime mm -hmm. generation of twenty to twenty five years for human beings as as we you know look at history. Um, about every three to five years is a completely new batch of people mm -hmm. walking into this material and and you know reading it trying to figure it out in a vacuum because mm -hmm. they can't be bothered to look outside of their own immediate studies or direct study of the text there's a lot to be said for studying the text directly mm -hmm. there's also a lot to, to be said for reading other people's discussions mm -hmm. i i can only uh, guess this but I, um, aaron could probably say it that no medieval scholar would come up with their own opinion without citing the classical uh, philosopher's opinion right. on this, that, and the other thing, and mm -hmm. and seeing where they differ and mm -hmm. where they agree. Mm -hmm. So that form of scholarship doesn't only apply in philosophy, it, apl it applies in every endeavor of, of scholastic and academic study. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So when you, as students, are looking for more information, don't be afraid to read other people's material. Don't assume that we figured it all out simply because we assume we have. Um, there are parts there are parts of the manuscript that I've been working with for 20 years that I still don't have a good feel for. Brian, Brian says, well, this is what it is. And that becomes the word of Brian. Well, in many cases, I don't agree with him. And, you know, we've had some kind of major discussions along the way where he just sort of gets frustrated and goes, all right, all right, enough. You know, because either I, I have a better position or, or he has a position that I haven't uh, improved on. But that goes for all of us and in every every form of this. Obviously, mm -hmm. my experience in armor is vastly superior to literally everyone in the academy. Um, but that doesn't make me infallible. It just my experience is deeper than others. There's probably someone who's going to go look at this material after training in another martial art uh, for quite a while and then it, and, and it all makes sense to them. But I can tell you from my own personal experience, there are a shitload of people that have trained, say, kendo or, or uh, you know, modern Olympic fencing that really just don't get this at all because there's no um, completeness to the systems, their sports systems. The only people that, that really have a clue of, of the breadth of this kind of thing are people that have studied some other military um, endeavor. So when you look at, um, say, Egerton Castle, who was who was a British military, I mean, he's obviously heavily influenced by the state of sport fencing in his period. But there were remnants. There was he was living in a period where uh, a lot of veterans had come back from uh, war in India or the Crimea and had to use their swords in earnest. And then, and then, you know, the lessons that were learned in Nassau often came out to be helpful, but just as often they were taken down by a cannonball or a musket shot. So mm -hmm. all of their Sal experience was of no use. It's like, you know, you can teach somebody all kinds of fine martial arts, but if they're in a helicopter crash, they're going to die because you can't teach someone to fly. It's a different world, right? Anyway, so yeah, and, um, my my general uh, purpose uh, uh, in this comment is that go and read as much as you can about other people's opinions, and you will very quickly begin to whittle down the outsiders, and you'll see the core. Uh, if you if you have absolutely uh, abundant spare time, you can go through the. Uh, various videos that the exiles have put out from the uk they've got one guy in the, in the states that did a little bit on posters which i wasn't too impressed with but um earnest and and sincere stuff nevertheless but uh the stuff by marky berryman uh, he's got a lot of really good ideas and, and and in some cases he's got a way of articulating things that i understand intrinsically but that really probably couldn't articulate as well but then again, he's, he's a much better speaker than I am. So anyways, uh, folks, uh, it's been a privilege to, uh, you know, be, be part of your Monday nights. For those of you that have uh, got along for the ride, I, I got in much later. Aaron ran the boat, ran the show for a long time and did a great job of it and continued to do 
really good work as as we uh, you know work together on this. And yeah. I'm just so pleased that uh, we've gotten through the Getty because I'm I'm impressed that it took almost 30 weeks. Yeah, it's been it's been great, and I think we gave it a uh, a decent viewing. We walked through it broadly speaking as uh, as slow and deliberately as I as I wanted. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and just a couple more things. One of the other themes of this course that we've been working through is we've been trying to talk about um, about evidence. So, you know, when you are contrasting opinions, um, you know, there's as many, there's tons of martial arts masters out there. There's an infinite number of masters who all have opinions, right? Uh, and Fiora even talks about this. But um, the fact that somebody has an opinion about something doesn't mean it's worth considering right well what what helps you stand out or helps you notice opinions worth considering is often the evidence that the is behind the opinion so you know someone says well this play is done this way okay why what's the argument what's the evidence right what what are your conclusions and then even further than that if you continue to talk and see this person's point of view and you find out that the way that they've answered your question is consistent with the way they would answer another question, i.e. they're not just giving you a random answer with some random justification, but you know they're looking at the thing that you're talking about consistently, whether you ask them about something, you know, one play or the other or the other, they're trying to give a consistent narrative. That's something that I've tried to give this whole course, something that Kel's tried to give, and, uh, you know, without you know, putting too harsh a value judgment on it. I, uh, it's been my experience that the best martial artists are able to give the most consistent views on how a system approaches problems, right? And so too much variation in a, in a, in a view uh, often is an indicator, I think, that someone's just kind of fudging over things they don't really understand or they're, or they're making stuff up. And the last thing I wanted to say is this. An important part of scholarship is divorcing yourself from your, your, your personal self from the ideas that you're discussing. So one of the things that we want to foster at Emma, one of the, th one of the kinds of scholarship that we want to foster is a kind of scholarship where scholars can get together and discuss the text and have strong opinions, disagree, and not go flame each other on fucking Facebook. Or tell each other that, you know, why don't you agree with me? I hate you, blah, 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 right? There's a lot of that in the world today. There's a lot of people who intimately associate themselves with the ideas, the very ideas they're discussing. So if you disagree with the ideas, you're somehow commenting on their value as a person. And one of the things that um, we hope to foster here at Emma is a scholarship that divorces the idea from the uh, from the person themselves so you can have a discussion have a debate like you would fence someone and you know uh, disagree and not feel like you're being judged as a person devalued whatever right at the end of the day the way we all get better here is we fight and the war of ideas is what we've been talking about here it's this discussion right and we all need to train together to really get at this text over the next hopefully 30 40 years that we talk about it so that at the end we can say we understand it a little bit as poor old men and women <laughs> as fury says so um that's it that's all i have to say um kel i really appreciate you um being on here thank you very much and uh everyone else as well um I think maybe that's the time to call it. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, it has been a pleasure. We will resume next week with Philip Ovadi. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into it right now with the scholar group. So we'll likely finish looking at Vadi uh, before we at the end of this recruit session. And then there will be more and different things. Uh, there's lots of online projects that Emma has in the wings and that nobody's had time to do, which we're going to need to get on with once we restart. So um, that's coming soon. Uh, thank you guys for being here, and um, I hope you guys have a safe and um, fun uh, next week. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Well, yeah. Good night, everyone. It's been really great. Thank you. Have a good night, folks. Have a great night, people. Good night. Good night.